Big up to Pet Talk Boxing UK. Boom. Nice one, D. Nice one. Thank you, Mr. Dillian White. Pet Talk UK. Oi, oi, welcome to the Pep Talk UK Sports Podcast, the podcast that talks the major boxing and football news from around the globe, real points of view from a real panel, hashtag real talk on Pep Talk. Please subscribe to Pep Talk UK on iTunes and YouTube. Don't forget to like, share and comment. I'm your host, Frankie B, and I'm joined by a sick panel. Firstly, I'd like to welcome from the capital city of France, Paris, Pascal, how are ya? Frankie B, bonjour, bonjour à tout le monde, Pascal is back in the building like Jay-Z 4.44. I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. So Pascal... I'm sure you've heard the, Wait. the news. Um, your compatriot, Lacazette, is landing at La- the Emirates. Gazette. Yes, another one before Brexit. Another immigrant <laughs> coming straight to England. But look, he's a good kid. Uh, I'm just concerned about the, his ability to convert and to get used to the physicality of the Premier League. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, the League A is not as, 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 uh, I mean, the first to say is not as competitive as the Premiership and, uh, but he has, he has shades of him, right? You know, he can mm-hmm. play very well of the, of the defenders, um, and of the wingers. So, you know, we, I expect him to, to provide a bit of pace up front. He's quite clinical. You know, um, will he be better than Giroud? We'll have to wait and see, mm-hmm. but it's certainly if, uh, if it's Wenger can, can keep Giroud. And add Lacazette to the to the to the strike force. I think he could make Arsenal quite a formidable force. As long as we also keep Ozil and uh, Sanchez, I think there's a definitely a good opportunity for Arsenal to have a bit bit more of a balanced team. You know. Yeah. So, are you worried of um, are you worried about Lacazette against Ryan Shawcross? Uh, well, you know, Shawcross <laughs> might well. Be- I may well want to give him the welcome to England. Uh, That's right, yeah. In, you know, and uh, and I, I just hope that he's resilient enough to to withstand it. But you know, French players can uh, adapt themselves very well to the Premier League. You know, they get used to it fairly quickly. You know, Anthony Martial, Thierry Henry, you know, Patrick Vieira, all these players so have done very well. Tour, Robert Pires, Cantona. Uh, of course, of course. You know, you'd be very hard pressed to see a French player that doesn't play very well in England. Um, so I think La Lacazette could do really well. You know, he's looking, he's been looking forward to an opportunity to, to join the, a good club at the Premier League. But also for him, his international career is also good for the French team because the World Cup in Russia is coming very soon and he wants to cement himself as a potential striker to be considered not just a bench warmer, but, you know, a, a, a player that can actually be fielded in the first 11. So I think this move for, for him is very good for his career. Yes, and certainly we've got a, a, an adequate replacement for uh, Sonogo, which is pretty good. <laughs> <It's only laughs> so, but more, more than adequate, I would say. But listen, so we all have to wait and see, you know. Can he adapt to the pace? Can he adapt to the game? Can he do it the first season? Or do we have to give him a two season to warm up and to get him used to it? And most importantly, can he, can he stay away from the English press and the newspaper? Because I'm sure the sun has already... Um, you know, maybe looked at potential women to distract him. So we have to, <laughs> we have to protect him. <laughs> we don't want what happened to Giroud to happen to Lacazette when he was caught with his, uh, with his wife once, you know. <laughs> and hey, Fasca, we move on. You, you want to shout out your social media? Yes, of course. We can get lots of followers. Thank you, everybody, for supporting the Petro Boys. Pascal underscore De Salle at Twitter and Instagram. Follow me, mes amis. Merci. Cracking. 
Right, now it's time to once again introduce a man who is back in the ring. July the 8th at York Hall. It's the Pep Talk Boxer signed to Goodwin Promotions. It's Linus Eudophia. How you doing, bruv? Uh, what's popping, man? I'm all good, I'm all good, I'm all good. How are you? Mate, I'm good, mate. I just want to know if you're fight ready. Oh, God, that's not even a question, man. They <laughs> ask me... Ask me something else, you know. Ask, ask me something. Ask me how I'm feeling today. Ask me how 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 good I'm feeling today. That's not even a question. <laughs> so, so overall, was today your last um, day of training and camp, and now it's all about just uh, focusing for the big fight this weekend. No, no. Today wasn't. Today wasn't. Tomorrow is the last day. Today wasn't the last day. Um, Tomorrow is the tomorrow is the the last day, you know. I mean, tomorrow is the last proper shakeout. I might have to maybe go for a swim in the in 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 uh, uh, like Thursday or something. But other than that, today is the last day I'm gonna go all out, and um, yeah, that's about it, really. Um, and yeah, that, that's it, really. You know, what I mean, it's just all it's all speed work now, so. It's, it's all speed work, so you know what I mean. Everything's everything's all there. It's just speed. It's all your speed work now. My strength's there. Fitness has been there for weeks, and just it's just the last little bits now. It's literally the last tiniest little niggles now. So, so I'm ready to go. I'm like literally itching, itching to get into the ring. So no no picking on any rich tea biscuits at night before before the weekend. Nah, nah. I stopped that about three weeks ago, man. But you know, you know, it's not it's not just <laughs> you know it's not just it's like you know not picking on any biscuits it's like you know women as well man they they make it hard like my girl I'll be around her house and like you know and, and it's don't get me wrong it's not like you know nothing we're, we're adults man we, there's no don't, don't you know, tell me don't here. tell me she put, yeah, some, adult, she, she, she put on some usher right no oh no no no, no. she like <laughs> she like go get a cake man you just like eat it in front of me man it's just it's <laughs> it, it, it's it's times where you really have to check your discipline and be like, you know what? So she there's went, something, there's she went, something bigger. She went she to Greg's on purpose, yeah. Yeah, man. She's she she's 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 got me. She's really testing my uh, what's the word? She's really testing how Result. determined I am in this yeah. sport. Yeah. All right. So, what type of sparring have you had? Oh God, what what haven't I had? Uh, I've had you know John Ryder. I've had some of the MTK boys. I've had match rooms, uh, boxes. I've had the likes of um, Craig Richards. You know, is it, um, we what's his name? John Ryder. Yeah, yeah. We're always, always working. We <laughs> so, there's so much fun. We've had some MTK boys come down to our gym, uh, sparring. We've been in and out with oh god, the fighters left, right, and centre. It's, it's, it's you know, what I mean, it's all coming together. And you know, what I mean, it, it, there's I learned a lot. I, I learned a lot from the sparring a lot more than I learn a lot more from the sparring than I do the fighting yeah. so you know it's the sparring's been top it's been top top I haven't I haven't been in you know I mean I haven't I haven't been in actually better shape than this if I'm honest with you so yeah, yeah I, I feel do you know what I mean right now I feel I feel ready to go man I feel you feel nice I feel great yeah I feel nice ain't the word I feel good I feel ready to go I just feel like I've trained for so long in a sense of like I've been in this camp since you know since just after March because I remember Brad was fighting so I had to get, help get him ready and um, you know I had to help get him ready for his fight and then I had to get Luke get ready for his fight and then I had to help Brad get ready for his other fight so I've been in this I've been in getting everyone ready and also getting my fight ready as well and it's just it's been so long now and it started to, a couple of weeks ago it started to take its toll and you know what I mean I started to really burn out and slow down and start going downhill but now we've, we've brought it back now and we're, you know, we're all good again we're all good again we're ready to go yeah. it's just been it's just right now it's just you know keeping keeping me sharp and monitoring the weight you know so what about tickets uh, well they can get a hold of tickets uh, you know through all my social medias they can contact me and message me all through my social medias Instagram uh, Facebook and Twitter Linus, Linus underscore Udofia uh, and um, and through my website lionishudofia.com uh, where you know you'll find YouTube links and highlights and previous fight videos and a nice little documentary about me if you are really that interested we'll be there backing you all the way brother yeah oh, you've been there since you were sports codes I'm not worried about that don't worry about that <laughs> right we're going to keep it moving now finally I'd like to introduce a former commentator and reporter for Sky Sports but now at Bournemouth FC can I get a booyaka shot for yeah. <laughs> Andy Burton how you doing Geese 
someone else has got to do that I can't do that (laughs) (laughs) and I can't do it for myself and I just I'm 39 I can't really be doing that anyway I don't think I'm too old for that now (laughs) so so never too old (laughs) (laughs) so what's been going on with you well, we met, didn't we, outside Wembley a few weeks ago for the uh, for the FA Cup final, and we started having a chat. And um, yeah, you told me about the podcast. I've been listening since then. I've had a little listen, and when you invited me on, it sounded like um, it sounded like a fun way to spend an evening chatting football and boxing. What, what more could you want to do? <laughs> so, so obviously, you used to work at Sky Sports for was that about ten years or so? Or? Yeah, I was there for I was at Sky for twelve years. I worked on on the football uh, laterally towards the end. I sort of branched out a bit and worked on the boxing. So, uh, obviously, with Sky's partnership with with um, with Matchroom, I was at all of those events. So, the first one I did was. Uh, Fox Grove, the first one up in Manchester. Yeah. And then, okay. yeah, went, went everywhere. But I was a boxing fan from, from 20 years ago, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Someone at home got me into boxing. Um, I used to go to local events, charity events, stuff like that, just where, where friends were going to things. And then it got to the point where I was saying to it, I went to, um, I went to Vegas as a fan to see Ricky Hatton against Floyd Mayweather. Went back to Vegas again when Ricky went there to, to fight Manny Pacquiao. And yeah, I've, I've really been into my boxing sort of all the way through. But but the last three years at Sky, covering it was um, was pretty special. And, and obviously got to do a lot of the Anthony Joshua fights as well. So so got pretty tight with AJ and, and his boys. And um, yeah, just I, I love it. I was at the I was at the O2 on Saturday night. And it's just a nice way to break things up from um, from going to football all the time. Otherwise, that gets that sounds crazy, but that can get a little monotonous if you just go to football, you know, all the time. It's nice to have uh, something else to go and watch, and, and boxing's been the thing, really. A bit of variety. So, in terms of football, obviously, you're now down at Bournemouth FC. What do you do yeah. down there? So, I was trying to find something that I could move into for the next stage of my career where I sort of took skills from, from my job as a journalist and career as a journalist and, and take them into something new. And I just was looking at it and the amount of footballers, the amount of agents, the amount of managers, chief execs that I knew, I had to stay in football really. And um, so now I work in player recruitment, so it's basically scouting, uh, looking for players for the first team, assessing transfer targets, and then working on, on making sure that we secure the players that we want to bring into the football club. So we've had a good summer. We've obviously brought in Jermaine Defoe, Asmir yes. Begovic, and yeah. Mufanaki already. Um, this is the end of my sort of first year with Bournemouth. I started with them last summer. Um, and they obviously had a fantastic season last season, staying in the league the way they did. Finishing ninth was incredible. Um, the, the way I look at the league at the minute is mm-hmm. you've been kind of split it into two leagues. You've got the top seven. Uh, and then you've got the rest. And I think there's, there was a very clear divide in the Premier League last season. If you look at Everton, who finished seventh, they won 61 points. Yeah. After that, there was a big drop down to, to Southampton and to Bournemouth on 46. And if you, if you look at it in that respect, in terms of the, the two leagues, we finished joint top of our league. You know, We probably can't finish seventh. Everton did that, and they've just gone and spent £90 million this summer yeah. already. Yeah. We're not we're not going to be able to go and compete in those sort of financial terms, but to to do as well as we can within that second tier within the Premier League, I think that's got to be the aim. We've got to keep growing, keep evolving, keep playing good football, uh, and just see where the journey takes us. Really. Yes, um, and and the good thing is, well, you can attract players by having a beach. There's that too, yeah. <laughs> there is that. A bit I know of rock Jermaine, as well. Yeah, a bit of rock. Jermaine, yeah. Jermaine Defoe's a huge fish and chips guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't look like it. I do, but he doesn't no, look like but, it. But. <laughs> he better not start either when he comes down there to be honest because we need him lean. He's, he's old enough we need to keep him lean we can't be having him pig out for some chips on the pier <laughs> brilliant 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 so um, Andy do you want to shout out your social media for the listeners yeah you can get on my Instagram I don't have Twitter because it's full of too many trolls but you can get on my Instagram it's <laughs> Burton. Um, yeah, it's Andy Burton. That's my Instagram, and uh, yeah, you can you can follow what games I'm going to because that's all it really is: games and me in the gym at the moment. That's it. And, and once again, Boyaka shot for Andy Burton, <laughs> the garage hit. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> I know, you, I know you like your Nike and Nike, and you know you like all the uh, um, Kyan Sparks and all that. I know that. I know that. Well, I used to DJ. This is a little known fact about me. I used to DJ garage garage music twenty years ago. I used wow. to 
I used to DJ that when I was growing up and I absolutely loved it and I've always kind of stayed stayed into it like and I just don't get a chance to to go out too much anymore and DJ Master Steps is a good friend of mine obviously you know Steps and um, yeah yeah Choice FM yeah uh, yeah yeah, Choice FM back in the day, exactly. He was on yeah. drive. And um, yeah, so I got to know Step Troop through. Um, he knew loads of the players that I knew, people like Anton Ferdinand, Nigel Will Coco, all those boys were never going out. Steps knew them. Um, and yeah, we just kind of we stayed in touch, and he was DJing down the road from me. I'm in Putney, and he was down the road in Vauxhall at the weekend, so I had nothing on, and it was a chance to go out and see him. And, uh, the legend MC Kai was there as well. Oh, yes. Um, got so we got you still, flying high. Yeah, exactly. So we were there hanging out, and uh, and then contrast that to my Sunday night, which was very last minute going to see Justin Bieber at Hyde Park with my son. Hey, how did you get from Kyan Sparks to Justin Bieber, Andy? I mean, <laughs> I've been, we're missing out what I did on Friday, which was Phil Collins, <laughs> which was actually for my dad's Christmas present. So Phil Collins was not for me, trust me. <laughs> That's some remix. That's some remix. Right, guys, uh, we're going to move on. Ladies and gents, for the fight fans locked in, for the football fans locked in, now it's time for some real talk on Pep Talk. Let's go! So we're going to start with the boxing and no doubt about it, the biggest headline of last weekend was Manny Pacquiao losing to a former PE teacher in Jeff Horn. Now Pascal, what happened? <sighs> Frankie B, I, you know, it, it's, it, it's very, <laughs> it, it's a very controversial decision. I don't remember anything as controversial since the OJ Simpson verdict. You know, uh, <laughs> I mean, for me, it's just I was very surprised. I mean, unanimous you know, decision it, as well. Unanimous. I mean, yeah, every single judge. It's unbelievable. I mean, okay, let, let's put this into perspective, Frankie B. When Manny Pacquiao fought uh, Floyd Mayweather, there was controversy, but you know, for me, Floyd Mayweather, you know, put on a masterful performance that evening. Yes, it was a ball fest, but it was a clinical ball fest. And for me, you know, I did not see Benny Pacquiao win much of the fight. So that was a unanimous decision. Floyd didn't get hit that much. And if we were to put Floyd there with her as Jeff Horn, you know, what was displayed last week, uh, last weekend, <laughs> people would have, there would have been an outcry. And people would have blatantly said that uh, Manny Pacquiao won that fight. Okay. I mean, Manny Pacquiao for me won that fight. You know, as far as my, my un unofficial scorecard was 160 to 111, you know, in favor of Manny Pacquiao. To me, Manny Pacquiao won it unanimously. The, 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 the ninth round, when the, the referee threatened to stop the fight, I gave it a tenth round because Jeff Horn wasn't coming back with anything, you know. Pacquiao for me at 38 years of age was still the more clinical was certainly still the most, you know, outwork Jeff Horn. I give credit to Jeff Horn because he was, you know, he fought a very courageous fight in front of his fans, you know, and he did very well to, to stay there all 12 rounds, you know. Manny Pacquiao perhaps was a victim of his own, you know, success by not knocking him out when he had the chance, you know. Perhaps he underestimated him a little bit. Maybe age come in, but for me, Pacquiao won the fight, and I'm not sure whether... You know, Pacquiao should take the rematch. I mean, the rematch certainly okay. would be, would, would make Bob Arum a lot of money. Top rank would benefit from it because now, you know, the whole world is talking about it. Social media was very active about it. And there's a rematch clause that tells Pacquiao needs to go back to Australia and fight there. So there's certainly an opportunity for Pacquiao to make the money. But, you know, in the context of the sport, you know, you know, Frankie B, we talked about this before. Yeah. There's been some very dodgy decisions from the judges and the referees this, this, this season. Very dodgy. But, very dodgy indeed. You know, it's a bit disheartening, you know, because, you know, these men work very hard. I'm not taking any way from Jeff Horn. He fought a very good fight, fought a brave fight. But there is no way that Jeff Horn beats back 117 to 111, which was one of the scorecards. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. There is certainly no way. If that is the case, then Logie Simpson is not guilty. 
you know, uh, and that, 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 that to me that doesn't make any sense, you know. So I was a bit disappointed by that, and I certainly want a bit more justice in boxing because you know it, it affects the credibility of the sport. Because even boxing casual fans, you know, people that do not know, spoke to me about it and told me that you, it is clear that Pacquiao won that fight, you know. But hey, it's boxing, and uh, we have to accept the decisions. But we certainly need the judges to be far more, um, you know, far switched on, yeah. Yes. They have to be far more accurate because this is not this is not acceptable. Yeah, because even the compu box showed the fact that Pacquiao landed more punches. He certainly, he certainly was for Kibi, but Pacquiao was the more busier and accurate fighter. And yeah. also, I mean, Jeff Warren, if he saw the way he was fighting, he was fighting a bit dirty, you know. He was taking <laughs> it back to, to the pub in in Brisbane by t- by holding Pacquiao in a headlock, you know. That's he right. Was Elbows, so he's, he's physically bigger than Pacquiao, physically taller, and uh, and you know, and normally you know maybe Landers can tell us, but when boxers are fighting this way, there's, there's a bit of desperation. When you're headlocking your opponent, when you're using the elbows, you try to find anything you can to disturb the rhythm of the, of, of the boxer, you know, and try to impose yourself, you know. And there's a lot of head clashes, you know. Pacquiao was really hurt and because of the head clashes, but apart from that. I felt that Pacquiao controlled the fight and Pacquiao was still very much, you know, a, a, a class fighter, you know, and the fact that he lost to somebody who does your GCSEs, you know, is certainly concerning, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but congratulations to Jeff Horn. I'm not here to, ba- to bash anybody. I, I respect both fighters. But, but Pascal, but, what I'm interested, how did Jeff Horn get the title shot in the first place? Well, I mean, it's... Uh, um, uh, oh, wow. yeah, exactly. Top rank fighters. Two top rank fighters. <laughs> Ladies, you know, we, we've got uh, Mr. Bob Arum, you know, he's, uh, I, I certainly thought that the fight for me, I thought was a tune-up fight for Pacquiao to perhaps fight Terence Crawford, or maybe to even tempt the Floyd Mayweather to a second rematch. You know, there could have been a lot of fights in the horizon for Manique Pacquiao, and maybe this World Tour was an opportunity for Pacquiao to, to get a bit more fans. You know, he fought in China, you know, quite quite recently. You know, um, and uh, now the fight in Australia was certainly another opportunity to to showcase the Pacquiao brand worldwide. You know, and uh, he certainly will go down as a legend. And uh, it was an opportunity for Pacquiao to just have a junior fight in front of you know 50,000 people, but it certainly backfired. It backfired big time, but not for Bob Arum, of course. Bob Arum is laughing his way all the way to the bank because the rematch will make him you know uh, more money than the first fight. But it's certainly for Pacquiao, you know, who spent quite a lot of time training for this fight, you know, uh, rehearsing everything that he needs to do to make sure that he wins the fight. He didn't do anything wrong for me in that fight, you know, he fought the way that we expected Manny Pacquiao to fight. But uh, he certainly had a decision taken away from him. And Pacquiao has been unlucky, you know. Um, it certainly, there were shades of the uh, fight with Timothy Bradley where the Bradley fight, the first time they met, Bradley never won that fight for me. Yeah, to be fair, it- he shouldn't be going 12 rounds anyway with Jeff Horn. Well, you know, even if it were, you know, he's, he's allowed to put on a boxing masterclass and outbox and outpunch the boxer that he's fighting, including Jeff Horn, and he's done that, you know, Frankie B. So, in fairness, he wasn't able to, to take him out, but he certainly outboxed him. And on, the, on that on that premise alone, you know, he should be able to get the, the point victory. The fact that he didn't get the point victory after boxing a very good fight, you know, is not fair. And have the judges been subjective by expecting Pacquiao to knock him, to knock out every opponent, particularly a guy like Jeff Horn, who's not particularly world class level, or not the household name in the boxing. You know, it is not up to Pacquiao. Pacquiao is is a, is a growing man. He's not the certainly the speed is not the same as before. So I noticed that his um, you know, his his his, his foot, his feet movement, you know, his footwork was not as you know as slick yeah. as he used to. And, and the knockout power is definitely gone. The knockout power is certainly gone, yes, but the accuracy was still there, and he was still able to hurt Jeff Horn, you know, um, and uh, that alone should get him the point victory. So it's very disappointing, very, very disappointing for me. It certainly is. Now, Linus, some people say Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, and Theresa May were the judges. Did you see it that way? <laughs> yeah, oh, mate, it's, um, yeah, it's quite disappointing, to be fair, for you know what I mean, because that... Uh, for you know let's okay if we're going to put it in terms of like you know financially Pacquiao's going to make a lot of money he's going to make a lot of money anyway you know what I mean for that fight alone 10 million, we'll 10 million dollars and, yeah yeah and then you know what I mean the rematch will probably make him 15 to 30 you know but 
his legacy is just yeah, it's absolutely in the dirt you know what I mean uh, to lose to uh, fighters of that class no offence to Jeff Horn and fair play to him for taking a belt to Australia but it's it's uh, it's just such a dis- it's so disappointing do you know what I mean it's just like he's like like if anything I'm, I'm on the page with Pascal everything like he said I was going to say to be honest uh, I felt like Pacquiao won that fight. Um, he made it a bit. It, it, I think he didn't realise how what size, or how big Jeff Horn was going to be because Pacquiao. You don't really see Pacquiao fight a back foot a lot. I mean, he was. He seemed like every time he got cornered, he'd just fight. Yeah, you know I mean, like he had to. Like you know, what I mean, it, it seemed like he was. He didn't realise Jeff Horn was going to be that big. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I mean, which part played a factor into it, but no, nowhere near enough to say, oh yeah, Jeff Horn really bored Pacquiao to, do you know, what I mean, to beat him. No way. Jeff Horn was walking into shots left, right, and center, and he couldn't, he couldn't um, take, he couldn't take some of his shots, and he couldn't really land any of his. Really, you know, I mean, he landed a few, but yeah. it, you know, Pacquiao absolutely done a number on him. Yeah. And you know, like some of these scorecards, it's it's, it's a joke. especially in the sport I'm doing. It's like, you know, what I mean, it's not, it's not a sport where I'll, I'll go score two goals and I've definitely won that game. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's it's a sport where uh, someone else after you finish the fight no matter what you've done it's in their hands still Yeah, you know like in the amateurs are this, and even the pros now is becoming well it's been like this for a while Was from when I saw they were uh, Canelo Alvarez and one of the uh, judges gave it a draw and I thought to myself are you joking <laughs> I gave Alvarez <laughs> one round yeah, just that, because maybe they didn't do anything do you know that what was, I mean that was a lesson they, in boxing yeah, I thought I thought to myself like when I see these dudes and like that, I think to myself, oh, like it's crazy. Oh, like, yeah. but then I think then I think to myself, there's a lot more than that. It's not just boxing; it's money. There's a lot of money. I am I'm not sure. Like, I'm not 100. This is just off the record. I'm just I wouldn't be surprised if mm-hmm. if this is a Bob Aaron thing. If he's just you know what I mean, he's just when you know what, let's just you know, this is a lot of people. Jeff Horn brought a lot of people here. You know, Let's why not give him the belt? Yeah, yeah, and just make a lot more money next time. Do you know what I mean? I would be surprised. I'm not. My insinuation is Bob Arum is as slimy as he looks. I'm just saying. Are you insinuating uh, that Bob Arum's like Vince Vince McMahon? Yeah, he's just a. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I think he's a snake, but well, you know what I mean? Because I think I think he's just right now he's just milking back up all he can before he, he he's really yeah. And Crawford's his out, next guy you know, in shot. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's milking him until he's shot. You know, maybe Pacquiao. Pacquiao's on his way out. He's been on his way out since he. Yeah, you know, I don't. I can't even say when. He's he's been on his way out for a while. And Hold on. Do, do you know what, Linus? I'm just thinking. I'm just having a thought aloud, right? Go so on. Pacquiao retires, right? Mm-hmm. Jeff Horn is a, a Bob Arum fighter, but Terence mm-hmm. Crawford wins all the belts against Indongo. All right. Yeah. And then moves up in weight, and then fights Jeff Horn. Not. Uh, as big as a fight as Terence Crawford and Manny Pacquiao though is it? It isn't but in terms of getting uh, uh, Crawford right his next big hope is strap it makes a well, lot of sense yeah well Terence Crawford I think Terence Crawford would do that anyway I think Terence Crawford's definitely do you know what I mean the, the, the next big thing in boxing I think, I think after Andre Ward Terence Crawford and uh, like you know all the lighter weights uh, Lemonchenko the rest of them they're, they're, all the, they're all the next boys anyway and like obviously the middleweights as well but I don't think I don't think we should be looking that far ahead. I think ever since the Nito Donaire, ever since the Nito Donaire got schooled, and which which, which is another reason uh, Rigando isn't as publicised as he should be. Uh, ever since ever since he schooled Donaire, Pacquiao's been back like Bob Aaron's back main focus again, and <laughs> he's just he's uh, absolutely milking milking the crap out of Pacquiao, man. It is sad. I you can, I don't know about you, but I don't know. He's, I can see that side. I can see that. I can see it happening. It's just Pacquiao's legacy is going to be ripped apart because he's going to retire on like stupid losses he should have never even had, mm-hmm. and you know what I mean. He's going to be just fighting fighters to make money out of it. You know what I mean? Like it'll be. Oh, let's fight the being Crawford. Lose against Crawford. Oh, let's fight. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's, <laughs> yeah. putting him in, putting him in fights like he don't need to because they know he can sell him. They know people, people will always. Well, I don't know about maybe the numbers anymore, but you know what I mean, people will watch. Do you know what I mean? Jeff Horn, that fight would never happen in England, in um, America. They, no one would have bought that. Mm-hmm. Nobody would have bought people on right. that. He would have made a loss. That's why he did it. And when was the last ESPN, time you yeah. heard? Yeah, when was the last time you heard? A champion to go into another person's, go into a challenger's backyard to defend, to defend, defend his belt. When, when was the last time you heard that? <laughs> that is, no, nah, like, there's a lot more, there's a lot more to it. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, this game is all about money now. 
and do you know what I mean like I'm with Petty Atlas when he was screwing man because I'm the same I, I would have said the same thing so I'm like yeah well done Jeff but I think you lost that fight man <laughs> <Do> you know <laughs> what I mean it, 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 like, I, no, this is I mean, this is no disrespect to Jeff because in that fight in the times where I thought Jesus he's just been cracked with an absolute like shot and he's still there and he's coming for it he is throwing punches he's not stopping and I'm thinking to myself fair play because Manny Pacquiao say what you want he might have you know lost his punching power but he's still got that prowess of like mm-hmm. I don't really want to get punched by Manny Pacquiao do you know what I mean like maybe you can say what you want and say oh he's lost power you still wouldn't take a punch he's still him, got a you? flurry of punches you know I mean? yeah oh you still wouldn't want to take a punch of him and I'm just thinking to myself like fair play to Jeff Horn for giving him 12 hard rounds you know what I mean but he, you know in my opinion he lost that fight but you know he has got to respect what the judges say and he you know, really turned my head the next day when I woke up and I was like oh, let me see some highlights of the fight and I saw him and he's like I lost oh my head I nearly slapped my neck <laughs> looking at my phone I was like what yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? It's, it's crazy. Andy Burton, what, what did you think of the fight? Did you think it was really as wide as um, the judges um, scored? 117 to 111, one of the judges? No, it was it was pretty hard to go along with the scoring. But the thing for me, right, surely your trainers teach you, and, and Linus, this is one for you, surely your teachers train you from when you first start boxing, and it's a, it's a common theme all the way through your boxing career, don't let it go to the judges. Yes. Mm. That's yeah. what you get taught from yeah. days in boxing. It don't take him out, do it. Judges. And do you know what? Clearly Manny Pacquiao is on the decline. It, you know, he was on the decline in the in the Mayweather fight. He ca- yeah, he came back and he beat Timothy Bradley, he came back and beat Vargas, but it's just not nice. Boxing has this way of of keeping fighters in the sport for too long. Yeah. Yeah. And Father time always wins. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me, it kind of feels like that with Manny Pacquiao right now. And obviously, so much of Manny's money goes into into the Philippines and, and goes into, you know, supporting that country and the people of that country. So I can understand from his point of view why he wants to keep fighting and keep trying to make money. Um, but you just, I don't like seeing these guys carry on too long and I kind of I, I felt he was shot in the in the Mayweather fight he was he was really really disappointing and you know that's going back a couple of years now <laughs> uh, and to be honest I, I don't like seeing them go too long I feel like Pacquiao's doing the, the same thing here but like I said for me the, the, the lesson is don't let it go to the judges you have to get the job done he should have got the job done he didn't get the job done so then you're wide open for something going wrong and, and as the guys have already said we've seen that too often recently and that would bring me on to my second point which is yes. that boxing is a sport and, and the guys hit the nail on the head boxing as a sport can't have too many more knocks to its credibility like that because coming up behind it is MMA as we all know UFC UFC. is on the rise I've been watching UFC since the mid 2000s in the days of Tito Ortiz and Randy Couture yeah about time and yeah I love the old school this UFC uh, and really really old school Uh, and you know what you just you can't have boxing take too many more knocks like that because UFC is drawing people in and and obviously we know what's happening with McGregor and Mayweather right now that's right yeah yeah and, and the sport combat sport generally is at a crossroads and I don't mean in in the space of a year but over a two or three year period boxing is is a a, a combat sports is at a crossroads right now because new people coming into the the, the sport the casuals you know that the (laughs) match that you heard talk about all the time you know the sport clamoring out to get these guys who've got money to spend on tickets on pay-per-views who, who are consumers you have to view sport like a business and boxing just needs to make sure that it doesn't have too many more of these mistakes because people will lose faith in it and that would be a real shame for the sport that's right there, there was a, there was a period in uh, British boxing especially when it was totally dead before the emergence of uh, matchroom yeah I mean I was I was around it I remember I said to the, to the boss of Sky Sports Barney Francis the managing director Carl Froch was in the Super 6 tournament yes um, and he had some Jermaine incredible Taylor. fights it was Jermaine Taylor wasn't it in the 12th that's right in, in the final seconds of the fight he came back and from the dead if you think about this now I'm pretty certain when I say that that fight and his fights over there were not screened live in the UK on TV and for, for a fighter who went on to sell out Wembley and to reach the level that he fought and the, you know, the Kessler rivalry and, and everything that he did towards the end there with George Groves 
for the for that fight and, and a tournament like that not to be shown on British TV, if you said that to someone who was into boxing now, they wouldn't believe you just because of the way that, that, that Eddie Hearn and Barney Francis have come together with Matchroom and Sky Sports and made boxing um, at the level that it is now. There was that time, and I said to Barney, I said, why are we not showing these fights on Sky? And he said, well, boxing needs to do a little bit back for us because I, I think yeah. they can the TV uh, broadcasters for granted a little bit and there were there were too many poor fights there were there were too many guys who were just fighting nobodies um and boxing now is booming and, and you don't want to see any damage to that because it's great fun right now what about um the other fighter jeff horn now obviously he's on the roll now he's the, he's the champ <laughs> and he's now he's calling out mayweather now he's you know he brought out the the walking stick and, and the boxing gloves and how would you see that will that happen what to fight mayweather that's right there's as much chance of me fighting Mayweather <laughs> at this time. Mayweather, I tell you that because Mayweather is doing, he's fighting one more time and that's it. He's fighting against Conor McGregor on the 26th of August. He's never going to fight again. He's going to probably get the 50, but he, he's not fighting anybody else. But now, I mean, Bob Arum, like you guys said, and, and just in case my lawyers are listening, I distance myself from <laughs> everything that Lina said about Bob Arum. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer, yeah? Disclaimer. <laughs> me too, Andy, me too. Yeah, you're on your own um, but look, he's, he's got all sorts of options. They'll, they'll find him money options, but no. I mean, Floyd sort of started to scrape the barrels, would he, and with some of the things that he was looking at doing in terms of kind of not fighting guys who were really going to challenge him, which, by the way, is, is why I think he could be in trouble against Conor, Conor McGregor. Maybe we'll talk about that later, but th- there's all sorts of options um, for, for Jeff Horn at this point, but, but realistically, no, I think that the amount of money that he's going to make from, from fighting Conor McGregor, there's no chance he's going to get in the ring with something like Jeff Horn. But, but, but could the unthinkable happen? Could McGregor spark out Mayweather? Could that happen? I see it as a lot closer than pretty much everybody else in boxing. Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons. If you look at some of the fights that Floyd's had towards the end, has he knocked anybody out since Ricky Hatton? I think he knocked out one guy, and it was when he, uh, there was the controversy, controversy over the, the referee, and he wasn't defending himself, and, and there was a low blow. Ortiz. Do you remember? Ortiz. 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 And he, Ortiz. And he, banged, he banged him out when he wasn't paying attention. I'm pretty sure that's the only guy he's knocked out since he's fought Ricky Hatton, and that was in 2007. He, he, he's a defensive boxer, right? He doesn't want to get hit. He wants to avoid being hit at all costs, and then, and then he starts to turn it on. What, I see Floyd doing in this fight is he's going to be working out the timings in the first couple of rounds. Floyd knows how quickly he can react to someone coming at him. He knows how quickly he can dodge and move and evade punches, right? He's unbelievable when it comes to the defensive side of boxing. So he's going to sound out Conor McGregor. If Conor can somehow work some kind of mind games with him where he he thinks so Floyd this is, Floyd thinks he knows what Connor's got and somehow Connor pulls something out that, that Floyd doesn't see coming I see that as a credible way for Connor McGregor to win the fight and spark him out I think it's possible I don't think it's likely I don't think he should be a 7 to 1 shot he's he's Closer in terms of the betting than some of Floyd's previous fighters who were boxers, by the way. <laughs> some of the fights that Floyd went into towards the end, the guys who were fighting were 10 to 1. Connor's 7. So he's got more of a chance in the bookies' eyes than some of the guys that, that have got pro boxing careers. I just think that he's hugely underrated at the moment in terms of the speed and the power. And I don't think it really matters what he's done in the past. I think it matters what he's capable of doing now. And Connor can bang. Like Connor can, he can hit, bang. He's got knockout power. He has. He's got knockout power and he's got knockout speed. You look at what he did to Jose Aldo. You look at what he did in some of his early fights. He's got unbelievable speed. Um, and I, th- I think people have, have underestimated him too much. And if I was looking for value in the betting markets right now, I'd be betting Conor McGregor because they are not as far apart as the bookies make them. I'm telling you that for sure. I truly believe that. 
Well, I'm looking forward to the press conference. I don't know about you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love those UFC press conferences. I watch them live on YouTube, man. They're <laughs> hilarious. Seriously. Conor McGregor knows how to sell a fight. And I tell you what, the one, the one area that I guarantee you, guarantee you that Conor McGregor wins is in the press conferences. He is going to school Floyd Mayweather. He is not going to know what to say. He is not going to know what to do. He does not have the banter. He does not have the comebacks. Conor McGregor is going to have him on toast in the press conferences. Fact. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to get many views, I must say. Uh, guys, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about um, last weekend's uh, summertime brawl, which was kind of lit. Now, Pascal, there Wait. were a number of promising fighters on the show. Who would you say impressed you the most? Well, well, you know, Frankie B was a fantastic show, you know, um, big up match room and all the boxers that participated. For me, the color band performance stood out very well, you know. As, as some far, development there, for sure. He certainly, you know, I mean, Kevin Mitchell is doing a remarkable job in training the young band fighter. I mean, I was very impressed with his head movement, his footwork. But most importantly, his punch combination, you know, he was able to, to throw two, three punches out. And punch selection. One arm. I mean, he was, he was quite remarkable. And if you remember, Frankie, where well, we saw him in Manchester last year, you know, to me, he's come of age more and more as a fighter. Every time he fights, he improves. You know, he's pretty much like a good friend Linus. You know, every fight, he gets better and better. So I've got a lot of, um, you know, I'm looking forward to Conor Ben's uh, fight, you know, with great anticipation, as I am with Linus, of course. And uh, it's just uh, it's just very, very interesting to see that, you know, that he's working very hard in the gym and he's certainly showing in his performances. So I expect Conor Ben, you know, to keep on going from strength to strength. And perhaps it's, it's, it's good for Matchroom to, you know, maybe up the ante a little bit, you know, and we want to see him against, a, you know, a much more, you know, difficult fight. But Kelly, to my call, he did very well. He took the fight in the last minute and, uh, you know, he did very well to... to yeah, he to tried, he tried. He, he tried, you know, and he tried to put it on Conor Ben, but Conor Ben just had too much for him. So there's certainly natural talent, a lot of power, control aggression, good, good boxing brain, good defensively, good head movement, good hand speed, good footwork. I mean, you know, the, the, the kid is uh, very gifted, you know, very, very gifted, just like his father. So I'm looking forward to, to more of Conor Ben. But in saying that, of, of course, Lorenzo Coley, I mean, you know, is still very, very much the, the, you know, the source man, you know. Uh, yeah, the penny boys. Yeah. He put on some extra, extra hot sauce on that, on that, on that TV. <laughs> on that right he's, hand, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, he's, the boy is a strong boy. He seems to be winning in the first round, you know, that he's, he's yet to go, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, eight rounds. My concern is, is you know, when that happens, you know, for the mm -hmm. box comes into new territory because they've never been in that situation. It can also create a bit of doubt in their mind because they used to knock out opponents so quickly. So maybe is it time for Lawrence Cole to start maybe getting a much more seasoned, durable opponent just so that he can, you know, exercise and get used to the, to the, you know, to the different rounds, you know, uh, maybe also apply more of his stamina and understand that, you know, he's not always going to be winning these fights within the first couple of rounds. Remember the judges? Yeah, I mean, yes, you certainly <laughs> have to be careful with, with the judges, but also for the boxer, I think a boxer needs to have that, um, confidence that they can got the knockout power but also has the ability to stay there for for quite some time if they have to you know and rely on the boxing because sometimes power you know the you know lots of quality throughout his career will come across somebody that can take his power and what happens then does that creep in your mind or can you just rely on your boxing because we learn that, that power is good to have in boxing but technicality and being technical boxer is just as important so course, i'd like yeah. to see lots of quality, you know in, in much more longer fights also, another good prospect is Chamberlain, you know. For yes, me, Chamber Chambo. Chambo, again, you know, for the Rhino, did very well, very, very well. First few rounds, you know, he certainly was trying to establish his jab. And, uh, you know, and that, that certainly was, was a bit difficult for him to establish that very, very early on. But eventually, you know, once, once Ryan Crawford, you know, was able to come into the, the, the distance of, of Isaac Chamberlain, Chamberlain picked him apart, you know, and was able to, 
to uh, to end the fight, you know, in in emphatic fashion in the second round. So that was that was really good, and I was very pleased for Isaac Chamberlain. Um, and that, that again, you know, is another one for the future in the cruiserweight division. We and certainly look forward to a possible uh, a grudge match between him and uh, Akoli in the future. Yeah. Yes, that certainly would be an interesting fight, you know. So, but I think, respectively, those two fighters should fight and build up their profile. Build the fight, and, yeah. Yeah, we could potentially have a big, big, big fight in England where you have two of you know, the biggest cruiserweight fighting out for each other, one for the future. Uh, also, Craig Richards, you know, the, our latest, uh, you know, uh, guest to the show, you know, fought yeah. very durable. We working, we working. Yeah, Rui Manuel Pavanito, you know, he, he certainly worked very, very hard. I mean, the, he was relentless, frankly, wasn't he? He kept on coming and coming forward. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, it's like he had an extra portion of Nando's, mate. Uh, throwing bomb, absolutely. I think he did that, you know. He was, he was, I was, I was quite impressed by his, uh, by his drive and he came to, certainly came to win, you know, but Craig Richards certainly boxed there and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, did very well to, to win the fight. For me, I think that Craig could have used the old school tactics of Smozarin, you know, Rui Manuel a bit more, you know, instead of engaging with, uh, with the Portuguese yeah. fighter. Mm-hmm. He had the opportunity to use his jab a bit more, to use his distance and to smother him as he comes in, you know, just to, to get to, to throw him, um, to, to, to throw Ray Manuel out of his rhythm, but nonetheless, very good performance and very entertaining fight, you know? Yes. Uh, Linus, what about you? When well, I was watching, uh, you know, a handful of, to be fair, uh, you know, it, it, the, the better question, yeah, yeah, the better question is like, who didn't, you know? They were pretty, Reese Bellotti, Jake Ball looked good. Cheeseman um, was a beast. Cheeseman, oh, Cheeseman looked incredible, man. Ooh. I've never seen so composed for his young age, for his tender age. I couldn't believe it. Um, uh, Connor Ben, yeah, Connor Ben. I've never seen Connor Ben. I, you know what? I've I've seen like I knew he could always box, but I didn't think he could box that well. Like I didn't that, think he could. He, could, yeah. he, he could, I didn't think he could have that kind of punch variety. I didn't think his foot movement, head movement, was that good. I knew he could box, but I didn't think he was that good. But do you know what I mean? Uh, but you know, it really surprised me. He was probably he. I was probably impressed with him the most. If I'm, I'm going to be honest, I was impre- I was impressed with. Uh, I was impressed with Conor Ben the most, and then probably Cheeseman and then Bellotti, to be honest. Uh, they're, they're, they're the ones that impressed me the most. Um, because uh, Bellotti's, Bellotti's fight, you know, he did what he always does. He, he's very, he's a very good pressure fighter. He picks his punches very well. Mm-hmm. He doesn't yeah. really waste any punches. He picks his punches very well. And, uh, you know what I mean? He systematically worked out James Spate. And James Spate, so, you know what I mean? He's, you know, he was a bit of a sketchy opponent, to be honest, if I'm yeah, really yeah, honest with you. Yeah, of course, yeah, but people were looking at that. he showed up, yeah, everyone was like, who is this guy? But he showed up, and he uh, respect. he did very well. He was, you know what, he had brilliant boxing ability, but the body shots just wore him down, and which I give credit to Luis Bollier a lot more, because that, that is how you break down a fighter. He broke him down from round one all the way to nine, and ended up stopping him. And that, I don't know about you, but I learned a lot from you watching that fight alone. And um, what do you call Jake, it? Jake Ball was good his, as well. Jake yeah, Ball Jake was Ball good. was very good. He was. Uh, it was a bit frustrated. I could tell he was a bit frustrated that night. He was a bit. He found it a bit frustrated because the guy uh, was a bit. You know, he was a cute, a bit cuter defensively. He was like, he was. Uh, what do you call it? He uh, knew how to like use the ropes and stuff like that. He knew how to mm-hmm. not get hit. Ring savvy to an extent. Yeah, to an to an extent. He knew how to not get hit. And then um, he got caught, and that was like the beginning of the end, and he ended up getting stopped. So you know, what I mean, it, it, it was it was a very good night. I learned a lot just from watching those uh, fighters ringside. But you know, I was really impressed with uh, Conor Ben from the last time I saw him, which was I think he it was seven months uh, ago. I think he had a break. Seven months yeah. ago, he last fought. Yeah, yeah. The last time I saw him was about then, and to now, he, he's improved so much, in my opinion. He's he's the one I thought that was. It was a really good show, though. You know, Big Lenny and um, Summers really uh, ended the night pretty well. It's a good fight. It, it wasn't as close as people thought, if I'm honest with you. I, you know, I don't think it was that close. I, I thought, I thought Big Lenny could have got him out of there. No, I thought, mm-hmm. uh, no, sorry, I thought he would have. But That's Summers thought, yeah. showed a lot. Show, Summers showed a lot of grit, and do you know what I mean. He came here. He, he wasn't here to just lay down, and uh, he wanted that belt. You know, so he represented Brom in the right way, mate. Yeah, that was brilliant, and um, yeah, so it was it was it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Um, it, it was a re- it was a really good night for boxing, and I really got I really got to learn a lot. You know, in general, just just the insides and outs of it, and you know, it, it's just it was just really 
it was a, it was a really good night. It was a really good yeah. character was, building, educating night. It was lit. It was lit. It was lit. It was good. It was good. <laughs> it, was, it was. It was. It was nice to be around that environment and just kind of see what. Uh, what. Uh, what do you call it? What a big. What a big whole show is. And what it's, you know, I mean, what it's like, and you know, you see, not, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't watch the fights just to learn. I watch the fighters. I watch how they deal with the pressures. I watch mm-hmm. how they listen to their coaches. I watch all these little things. I watch how, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Just how they deal with the pressures and the, uh, before and after the fights. And do you know what I mean? I watch what they post. I, I watch what they're doing after the fight. I watch, I watch everything. I want to learn everything. I want to, do you know what I mean? Like, because I, I'm, I'm in this trade as well, so you got to take all the good and bad. I watch all the good things. I watch how when when people lose as well. Like I, I watch that. I watch mm-hmm. how they take it. I watch what the tales are before they, they lose and stuff like that. So I can learn. You know what I mean? I can learn all these sort of things. Well, I, I like. You know what I mean? All this sport is about learning. If I can learn as much as I can in the time I have in this in this game, then you know what I mean? I can just maximize my chance of being successful. No. That's right. Yeah. And you're gonna take that into your fight. July the 8th I'll just plug it again July the 8th baby July the 8th uh, doors open at half 5 first fight is on at 6 it's going to be a good night it's going to be a very good night for boxing <laughs> that's uh, Frank, right uh, Frankie B what did you yeah. think of the Joshua Boatsy performance I thought Joshua Boatsy was very good um, did you see in the first moments of the fight when he caught him for a body shot I thought wow lovely. this was yeah, like I always, uh, yeah go on I thought, wow, is it going to end that quickly? But then, obviously, the guy stuck it in there. But the way he was timing his shots, he was his guard was tight. He was literally picking the guy to pieces round by round. And he, it was a superb performance. Um, I think most people expected that from Joshua Boazzi anyway. But I think the reason why Conor Ben t- stole the headlines is because the improvement from his last fight to now he seems a lot more patient and it's, it's, the sh- it's the punch selection that has increased which is what people recognise um, but Joshua Bratzi credit to him it was a great debut also it was Andy Burton we're all going for Conor Ben uh, we thought Joshua Bratzi was n- neat and tidy as well he was spectacular who caught your eye? those two caught my eye but because of as much the swagger that they brought to the event as the technical boxing performance and, and demonstration that they put on, they've both got that little bit of stardust. And from my point of view, you know, as someone who, who was a broadcaster for a long time and mm-hmm. would be standing there interviewing those guys on, on stage at the weigh-in and, and at the fights and stuff like that, they've just got a little bit of stardust. And you have to have that in this game because That's after right. all, it's entertainment. And they've, they've both got it. There was something about Buatzi in terms of the way he looked and the way he came across. Like he looked crisp when he came out. Obviously, anybody who, who Anthony Joshua decides to take on and start managing, you know that they've got good people around him. You know that they've got the good connects in the game. You know they're going to look the part. They know they're going to be linked up with all the right people. So you just kind of feel like if AJ is stepping into management and getting involved with Buatzi like that, he and his people, you know, the guys around him, have obviously seen something that they like for them to kind of take that step and then the the Connor thing is just intriguing I like the fact that his dad is kind of there but kind of in the background my my big <laughs> my biggest yeah. annoyance with with Chris Eubank Jr is the fact that his dad is always yeah, there yeah. and he's kind of stealing the limelight but Nigel's there and and, and Nigel's kind of in the background but but still he's a part he's not overdoing yeah. it yeah yeah, exactly. He's letting Connor have his time and he's being there to kind of protect him and help him and he loves it by the way. He loves being in the ring. I caught a glimpse of him there when he was in the ring. He just he's obviously still got a buzz for it. But for me those two they've they've just got a bit of swagger, they've got a little bit of stardust. You need that to get to the top. You can't just rely on being a you know, a, a good technical boxer, you know, someone who who gets a good record together. You can have an unbeaten record after after thirty fights, but if you haven't got a personality, if you haven't got mm-hmm. a bit of a bit of like I said, that, that stardust upon you, you're not gonna make it to elite level. I think potentially those two have got it. And there is a lot of great boxing talent in the UK and the summertime brawl certainly showed that. Now it's interview time. Firstly, our boxing correspondent Shaz at last weekend's summertime brawl caught up with the body snatcher Dillian White, 
who talks about what he has lined up in the near future and possibly fighting out in the States. Pep Talk UK are joined by a man who's a mountain. Who calls himself the Enigma now? <laughs> no, I call no, him no. the Body Snatcher. I'm it's Mister <laughs> Mister Dillian White. Cause someone just called him Mister Dillian White. They all pass. How you doing, dude? I'm, do- I'm good, Shaz. I'm good. It's about time we caught up for an interview. It's been a while since I've interviewed you. But yeah. What's happening? You, you, uh, do you know? I look at you. I watch you. I stalk you on social media. You're all about eating the right food. You're all about training hard, and you're all about putting stuff about me on your Insta post and embarrassing me. I'm trying. I'm. I'm, ju- I'm just trying to be the best me I can be. You know what I mean? Before I was doing everything by myself, I'm doing it all. I was doing it the hard way, but not the right way. You know what I mean? So now I'm just trying to be more professional, trying to train better, and trying to do myself do myself proud now and make sure everything is on point. I got the right functional energy, training better, getting physically stronger, physically fitter. Now. There's a champion sitting in America who's not answering your call at the moment. What's his problem? His problem is his belly's yellow. You know, that's his problem. His belly's yellow. He's the coward of the county. That's what he is. The end of the world, he, he, he should be ashamed of himself. You know what I mean? You know, there's a problem with boxing. Guys are scared to lose. Everyone is scared to lose. If you look at boxing, all the great champions over the history, they've all lost. You know why they've lost? Because they fought great fighters that's in their prime and hungry fighters who wants to win. So that's the problem. These guys keep fighting bomb. Look at the end of his last 10 opponents. Like, who are they? Apart from Stiverne, who else has he fought? I'm higher ranked than... I'm, I'll be, since he's been champion, I'll be the highest ranked fighter he's ever fought in the rankings. I'm higher ranked than Washington, Spilkard, a lot of them. I'm higher ranked than all of them. He just don't want to fight someone who's hungry and will come to fight and who can take a punch and who will be scared to, to, to have a go at him. Now, you got a fight that's been announced in August mm. in the States. First time abroad? Yeah, first time fighting, fighting, fighting abroad. You know, same in my pro career, so it'll be good. I think it'll be a new challenge for you, training in different climates, getting ready, not having a home crowd behind you. Hey, this is what it's all about, man. This is what it's all about. I, 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 want, I want to, you know what I mean? It's not preparing me for when I become a real champion, you know what I mean? Because when I become a real champion, I would like to defend my belt in other countries as well. So this is all, this is all a small step. It's all small stepping stones, you know what I mean, that we're trying to put in place to make sure when I get to the big, the big stage, I'm ready. How hungry are you, Dil? I'm always hungry. I'm a heavyweight. <laughs> <laughs> How hungry are you for success, brother? I'm always hungry for that too. I'm a heavyweight, <laughs> you know. I'm always hungry, man. Success, you know. What I mean, I, you know, I, I will be successful because I work hard and I never give up. You know, what I mean, and, and I see it as I ain't got no chance but to succeed. I've been through enough, enough crap in boxing now. You know, it's time for me to to turn the corner and start shining some light on my life and my career now. You know, what I mean, being successful and achieving my dream as becoming a world champion. In fairness, you've not had it easy so far. Nothing's been no. handed over to you. You've had people avoiding you, not wanting to fight you having weird stipulations so I reckon it's your time and the time is now yeah damn man that, that's what I'm hoping to I'm hoping that you know you know, everything's everything's got its time you know in this day and night everything's got their time you know what I mean so hopefully my time's coming now I'm, I'm working hard I'm trying to give it my all every day and trying to make sure I'm ready when the time comes well we at Pep Talk are going to be following you we're going to be having to watch it on TV unfortunately we're not going to be in the States with it well Pep Talk always gets to the fights though yeah well, I know why? but you know what it's it is it's a big fight yeah I know I want to get to the it's, States it's, it's, okay, I'm it's the sw- first listen, I'm gonna tell you, full I'm gonna unification tell you. fight I'm gonna tell you, in, in years I'm going to tell you and I'll tell you everyone do you know the only reason I don't go to the States right. because of my colour and I ain't having no cavity searched that's alright, don't search your cavity. <laughs> no, you're alright, man, you're alright. Just, just, you're right, you're right. You'll you be alright, man. You should get over there, you'll be alright. You yeah, you'll be alright. I've got a man on the ground who'll be there covering you the class. You should be alright, so bro. they'll be showing you love out there. But Dylan, we wish you the best of luck in the States. Go Thank get that win. Thank you very much, Shaz. Your journey continue. Thank God. Lovely, brother. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Thank you, Mr. Dillian White. Next up, we hear from Freddie Quit who will fight for the Southern Area Welterweight title against Eric the Eagle Ochen this weekend at York Hall. Pep Talk UK are joined by a guy who I'm a little bit intimidated by and the reason why is because he goes by the name Pretty Boy. It's Mr. Freddy Quit. How you doing, Freddy? Yeah, I'm great. I'm great, thank you. Freddy, background. Where are you from? Um, mixed up, uh, half German, half Liberian, 
So my mum is from Liberia, my dad's from Germany. And before you started fighting in the UK, where were you based? I was based in Germany um, about I don't know, six years ago, five, six years ago. And then, um, yeah, came over now to, to, to the UK. You've had a few... You've had a few pro fights already. Yeah. You're in the double digits. You've had, what, 12 pro fights? 12, yeah. You've had a title shot. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and now you've got another one on Sunday. You're fighting for the Southern Area title against Eric the Eagle Uching. How is that fight going to go down? Well, I'm going to raise my hand on the end of the night, that's for sure. Are we looking for a stoppage? Are we looking for points? Have you got... Are you going to go in there and go pow, pow, pow? Or are you looking to take it easy, work it? You know what? Last time I, I predicted things and, and and it didn't work out that way. This time I'm just going to be doing my thing. I'm just going to be be me, just boxing. When it, when it comes, it comes. But I'm not going to look for it this time. I'm just going to just gonna be the winner by the end of the night, that's for sure. I've seen something change in your routine and that's someone dear to my heart someone I spent a bit of time with who's got a cracking stable already an experienced campaigner Mr Terry Stewart I've seen you working with him recently how are you getting on with Terry? Yeah Terry is, is great I'm learning a lot um, totally different to, to other trainers again but um, yeah I really, I really appreciate it. he helping me out for this fight and and um, great, great, great gym. A lot of um, hungry fighters in there. So um, I'm happy to be training in that gym, actually. Yeah. Tell me honestly, mm -hmm. out of that whole training routine, the sparring, you've got the likes of Linus in there, you've got the likes of Brad Pauls, even Ellis Stewart in there, the Robbo boys, you've got Paul Greenwich. I bet you hate them hill sprints. <laughs> Because that's a nasty hill it takes you, know, you to as well. I, I, we done it, was it, two days ago, and my glutes are still on fire. It's, it's crazy. I know that hill he takes them <laughs> yeah. to, and he says to me, Shaz, you want to come down? And the thing is, I'm scared he's going to make me join in. Yeah, and I, I'm happy being the water carrier or the orange <laughs> boy. I ain't doing none of them hill spins, no. man. I fancy walking up and down stairs. But you know what? It's, if, it's, if it's bad, it's most of the time it's good for you. So, you know, you have to take the positive. But it's definitely it's hard work. <laughs> Over the weekend, we were together at mm -hmm. the Matchroom show. You saw a lot of the up-and-coming youngsters fight. Southern Area title, go and win it. I think big hall fights are not too far down the line for you. We at Pep Talk are backing you. We're sponsoring you. Go get that win. Yeah, I will. Yeah, definitely. I've, you know, I've been... I've been on the big shows before. I know how it is, and and it just makes me like want to go back to it. So um, yeah, I just have to keep doing what I'm doing now, win the title, put me back in the position I was before, and then keep going step by step, climbing up. For our listeners that want to give you a follow on social media, what are your handles? Um, they can at me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook um, at Team Kiwit. Um, or Freddie Kiewit you can find me out there well Freddie thank you for your time today good luck Sunday thank I'll you. be there cheering you on Thanks. as will the pep talk team go get that win thank you appreciate it cheers brother you thank take you. care thank you bye thank you Mr Freddie Quit. finally we hear from a promising heavyweight Joel Dussel will make his pro debut at your call July the 23rd. Pep Talk UK are joined by a chap that I'm slightly intimidated by because I'm going to get a kink in my neck after I finish with this interview. He's laughing, but when you see the picture of this, the man is big and even I can't tip it out that much. I'm going to let the man introduce himself. He's going to be debuting on the Dovebox show. His name is Joel Dussel. Uh, you know, Midlands boxing heavyweight champion. Uh, my first pro debut, 23rd of July at your call. I can't wait. Now, you're a big guy. What have you been eating? <laughs> you know what? Good question. But you know what? If you want to know, really, ask my mum because 
<laughs> she's me feed. She she feeds me good Caribbean food, man, and that's all it. That's all it. That's what I get it from. You know what I mean? Straight yeah, Caribbean food. Banana. Yam, green banana, ackee and salt fish. Name it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's all it's all in the pot, baby. It's all in the pot. All them steaks, yeah, and then jerk chicken, rice and peas. Everything's just all Caribbean food. This one's so big. You know what I mean? Now anyone listening in right now, we do talk boxing on there, but my man here has turned it into like Delia Smith's cookbook or something, <laughs> and telling away all his mama's recipes. Mama not going to be happy with you, boy. Don't let her hear this. Um, now, you're training out of, even though you're a Birmingham lad, a Brummy, you're training yeah. out of a gym in South London, a gym I know very well. Miguel's, who's training you in there? Yeah, I've got two two good special trainers, you know what I mean? One, one trainer is done, another trainer is done. Um, both of them put a lot of time, a lot of effort in me. You know what I mean? That they, 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 they never like um, rush me. They always take. You know what I mean? They want to make sure that uh, you know when I go in the ring and everything's spot on, perfect, and that they really like look after me. You're coming in as a heavyweight. You're making your pro debut. What are your goals? What do you want to achieve from your boxing career? <clears throat> Many, many goals, you know what I mean? First goal is to be a world heavyweight champion. That's the first goal. And um and, and you know what I mean and, and chase ch- chase my dreams and, and making reality and um and get many titles as I can. Well we as Pep Talk are gonna be watching your debut. I'm assuming by your size you're not looking to outpoint someone, you're gonna be smashing someone in. We'll be there. Now for the listeners of the pod that want to give you a follow, what's your social media handles that they can give you a follow? Yeah, um, you know, feel free, like, more than welcome. Follow me on um, Facebook. Um, my name my name is Joel Dussel. Type it in. Same as Instagram, Joel Dussel, um, champ. So, yeah, follow me on them social media. Well, bruv, if I want to do a bit of sparring... Should I just stay out of the ring and feed you some oranges? Because I ain't getting <laughs> nowhere near the ring with you. <laughs> Uh, listen, no problem. You know what? Actually, just feed me some mangoes and some uh, rice and peas and jerk chicken. I've just <laughs> seen this man already devour like three sandwiches, tank himself up with loads of water. Trust me, man can eat. Watch this space. I've got a funny feeling. Big things to come from this chap. My brother, thank you very much. Yo, you take care. Oh, love. Yeah, you too. Lovely. Yes. Cheers, buddy. Thank yeah. you. Cracking interviews. Thank you, Shaz. Now it's football time and until the season starts we're going to look at some transfers. Now Pascal, oui. as we touched on earlier, your French brethren, Lacazette, is a good man, mate. I think it's the most that the Wenger has paid for anybody. If I'm not you, you, think, you, you think he'll sleep well after spending that money? I, I think that Wenger is probably selling some of his prized possessions on eBay. But uh, <laughs> it's certainly uh, certainly a, b- a big buy for for Wenger, and uh, he's, he's a player that he's been courting for quite some time, you know. But um, if you remember, Frankie, we were the Emirates Cup two years ago when uh, yes, we that was was there. Well, and well, you know, I mean, we weren't really impressed by the guy, you know. The guy wasn't really impressive. We we didn't really see much of him, and uh, you know, I'm quite surprised. But yeah. since, since then, in fairness, he, he's been a top goal scorer and he was second top goal scorer last season. So he has come on quite a bit and developed his game. And, and also he started to play for the national team as well. Yes, of course. He uh, certainly has done that. You know, um, and you know, you, you, you are right. He has come leaps and bounds for, for Lyon since, since um, you know, that we saw him play. So he certainly has developed into the player. We just hope they can make that transition of a uh, Lyon striker into the Arsenal. You know, in England, of course, the expectations are much higher than in, than in Lyon. In Lyon, it was probably playing, playing with less pressure, more creative freedom. You know, in Arsenal, there will be, there'll be a pressure for him to score the goals. You know, yeah. the Arsenal fans are also very um, demanding fans. You know, we want. That's right. You got you troops know. in. You got troops in DT on the sideline demanding. Of course, <laughs> shout out yeah. troops. Shout out DT. Of course, shout them out, you know, big up the, the Arsenal fan TV boys of, oh, also. But it's going to be very difficult for Lacazette like to to have to find the goals week in, week, in, week out, you know. There's a big, uh, big shoulder of expectancy for Lacazette. Like 
you know, we'll have to see whether he's strong enough mentally and, you know, to deliver. Wenger sees something in him that he believes he can, you know, be that player. So let's just wait and see. Let's hope that he's uncovered, you know, a hidden gem. You know, it's been quite a long time since Wenger bought a French player, you know, that has the, you know, the expectations of, um, you know, of, 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 a, of a club on the shoulder. So I'm hoping that, like I said, could be that player, certainly, you know. Well, Andy Burton, um, one would argue and say, is it necessarily uh, an improvement on Olivier Giroud? Because Olivier Giroud scored more goals for France and Lacazette has only got one goal in, in 11 games for France. Yeah, but then, I mean, Lacazette's only played 11 games for France in, in four years now, so he, he, he's not really had the opportunities. I think... You know, this is this is my world now. This is player recruitment, and for me, this is not a hidden gem. This guy has consistently hit goals now in, in this league. You have to say that he's, he's he's got everything that you could get from a guy who's not playing in one of the top two leagues in the country. It, it, oh, sorry, top two leagues in, in Europe. If, if mm-hmm. La Liga and the Premier League are the best two, he's as good as you're going to go and find. Outside of that, of two yeah. leagues. So if, if that's the market that you're looking in, it's it's a market that that Arsene knows inside out. 14, 15, he got 27 goals. 15, 16, he got 21. Last season, he got 28. He's consistently posted the numbers. I don't think you can really look at the the national team um, stats but, too much just because of the players that are in that team and and competing for places. But he's done it in the in the. European um, Europa League he's, he's done it in the Champions League too he's been consistent in, in league uh, you have to say that that like I said that's as good as you're going to get if you go outside of the top two leagues for me the one question mark I have is why has nobody gone for him sooner because yep. he's just turned 26 and for me if you, if you go back four seasons he wasn't really scoring but for three years he's been doing it now I would just question why nobody's taken him before now but yeah, I, I think it's one where you, you have to say that he's got every attribute physically from the profile point of view that, that you'd be looking for if you were recruiting a top level strength. And, and you see Arsenal style of play because you've got the master assister Ozil feeding through those through balls that Lacazette can run onto. I think that suits someone like Lacazette better than Olivier Giroud. That's Olivier, it. Olivier Giroud is is a good um, target man he's like a complete forward he's got that physicality as well um, but for me the amount of times that Sanchez gets in behind when they play either the 4-3-3 or the 4-2-3-1 with him sort of pushing up wide with Giroud through the middle there's as much time where you need to be as a number 9 running at full pelt towards the goal to get on the end of crosses and balls into the box as you do hold up playing set pieces and I think that someone like Lacazette will offer more in, in those kind of situations than the Olivier Giroud and probably that's been through. I don't know that he's the he's the perfect fit for Arsenal's style of play Linus what about um, let's talk of Arsenal adding Mahrez to Lacazette um, is this also again an improvement on the attacking players at Arsenal Mate, if that happens, Arsenal will rapidly have a pretty... Well, not like they don't have a good strike force now in Sanchez and stuff, but and, um, Giroud, but... Yeah, and Ozil, you know what I mean? But uh, Mares will definitely, definitely cause a lot of problems in a lot of Premier teams this season if that if, if he comes in. Moving on um, from Arsenal, Andy Burton, Everton have signed Michael Keane. They spent a lot of money recently, and they've got a really promising centre-back on their books now. Yeah, Michael King's an interesting one because obviously Manchester United have made a load of money out of that deal as well. I think they picked up six or seven million quid from the sell-on that they had. Easy um, money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although you say that, they probably spent about eight years developing him. So, uh, <laughs> But yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting one for, for Michael. Um, I still think he's got a fair bit to prove playing for, for Everton he's not playing at the top 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 level just yet because he's not going to be Champions League I was surprised when I saw him being linked to Manchester United I didn't think he was at their level to go back to to that club but yeah I just think where, where they want to be and where Everton are I think are just too far apart so I couldn't see him going back to Manchester United I just asked myself what is the next level for Everton are they going to try and break into the top four you know, after you get top four this year, are they going to be better than Arsenal? They certainly are showing some intent, uh, and I don't think this—I don't think the spending's over. 
it's good that of money that they're spending though if they don't come off big questions will be asked yeah. and, and I suppose as well you can ask questions I mean they spent 30 million on, on uh, Michael Keane and he's only got two England caps um, the same could be said of Pickford not many caps and 30 million again um, it's really questionable you're paying for potential there and that's the thing that, that people don't always fully get to, to grips with it's not how good they are now mm-hmm. it's what they're going to go on to become and then how much it would cost you to get them when they become what they could potentially be so you're kind of you're ta- you're, you're if they're on an upward curve in terms of their development and they're kind of the, the line is going up the graph you have to get them before they get to the very top because at the very top Everton wouldn't be able to buy them they'd go to Chelsea they'd go to Arsenal they'd go to Manchester United Manchester City etc so you have to try and time it at a point where you're still going to have value for them in the market where they can go up and they can improve but for the years that you have them they're good enough and it's really really difficult to do that if you look at what we've just done with Nathan Aki right at Bournemouth we've just picked up Nathan Aki for a record fee let's say for argument's sake that's, that's 20, his, M's. Yeah. 20 million pounds right Nathan Aki is left sided he's left footed he's a brilliant passer of the ball he can play defensive midfield he can play left back um, he's got a versatility there in his positioning and his positional ability He's got the ability to play football. He's got huge scope for, for increase in value because if you look at it, would there be bigger clubs that could come in and, and try and sign Nathan Aki from us in a couple of years' time? Obviously, because Bournemouth are not one of the biggest clubs in the Premier League. Can we then potentially look at, at selling him for 40 or £50 million pounds when he gets to that level? 100%. And those are the sorts of signings that I like to try and make. Ones where you've got resale value, you've got scope for improvement, and what I like is that Eddie Howe and the, the rest of the recruitment team at, at Bournemouth saw in Nathan Aki an ability to play at centre-back that others didn't see. He yeah, played yeah. loan at Reading from Chelsea as a defensive midfielder. He played on loan at Watford as a left-back. He played the full season at left-back before he came to us. But, but the scouts and the recruitment team at Bournemouth had the vision that he could be a centre-back. And he's been one of the most sought-after centre-backs in the, in the Premier League this summer. And I think Bournemouth have done a great job in getting him in. You know, from a distance, you can kind of mistake him for Rude Hullet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what, look, he's got that ball-playing ability that, that reminds you of Rude, but, but defensively, the thing that you won't have maybe noticed about Nathan is his aerial ability in, in comparison to his height. He's got an yeah. unbelievable leap on him. He played his first game when he came on loan to us last year. Um, he, he came in for, for a suspension at the time, I think it was, a suspension on injury, and we were playing at Stoke. And I'm not going to lie, I was worried because he's not the tallest centre-back and you know what it's like going to Stoke. And he played there. And not only did he play brilliantly from a defensive point of view, he scored a headed goal. And at that point, we kind of realised, yeah, do you know what, this kid's got what it takes to play centre-back in the Premier League. Big things. Bournemouth are splashing the cash, as they say. But um, just staying with um, the Everton transfers, well, possible transfers, Pascal. Wait. Rune. 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 <laughs> Is it the return? Could it be? Well, I think for um, it would be a step backwards for uh, Everton, if I'm honest with you, because, you know, I mean, when Rooney is a shadow of himself, you know, he's not the player that he once was, you know, and also can Everton even afford the wages of when, of when Rooney, he's on almost 300,000 euros a, a week, you know, he's quite a lot of money for a player of his, of his age and of his uh, now ability, you know, uh, five seasons ago, Rooney, of course, you know, you have, anybody would pay that kind of money, but I think that David Moyes negotiated a very good deal on behalf of Wayne Rooney and his uh, pension scheme, you know. Um, in, terms, <laughs> in terms of Wayne Rooney, I mean, certainly I think he's, he has the, 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 the worldwide accolade to be playing in the MLS or maybe even in China. But even in China, they are starting to, to put a cap on, on, you know, the acquisition of foreign players. And, uh, you know, those, those astronomical sums will certainly no longer be available for a lot of the players. So, you know... I think that for Wayne Rooney, it would be a romantic idea for him to go back to his boyhood club and to finish his career o- over there. If that's what Wayne Rooney wants to do, fair enough. But can he play the full 90 minutes and provide the ability and provide the, you know, the, the, the quality that Wayne Rooney once had? I'm not too sure that Wayne Rooney is still that player. Now, Linus, I don't want to yeah. leave you out here. 
I don't really know what's going on with Southampton, mate, but um, who would you like to see at Southampton? What have you heard? What's the word uh, in the street? Uh, personally, well, well, it's been quite disappointing, really. I haven't really heard anything since uh, <laughs> Cesare's, since they got that centre-back on loan. I don't even know if they're going to keep him or they're just going to let Tottenham have them again. Like they did, uh, I mean, like they did, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Out of the world. But, um, you Van know, Dijk, really, you, you, you want to keep a hold of Van Dijk, really? Yeah, we want to keep a hold of Van Dijk. Dijk. And we don't really want to really let any more players go, but... Right now, oh, Southampton. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't really see anyone in the sights for their transfers, so which is quite, which is poor. But at the same time, it could mean that they've got someone coming through the youth. Who knows? It would be nice to, you know, grab Luke Shaw back as Man United don't really seem too interested, mm-hmm. really, in him anymore. It could be worth trying to get him back. <laughs> so you know, for a play for a team that keeps losing all their players and. You know, I'm nearly in tears saying this. You know, for a team that keeps losing all their players, and there's nothing. You know, we're never really I, since ever since ever since we um, we were in second place for a while, and we ended up finishing, I think, sixth that season. I don't think we'll get any more than that unless we close our close our transfer gate and stop letting our players out. I should yeah, just I think we'll finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Southampton, they've got one of the best scouting networks in the Premier League. It was set up by a, a guy called Paul Mitchell working underneath Les Reed, the technical director. Paul Mitchell's just leaving Tottenham now as head of recruitment, which is where he went after he was at Southampton. And I know Paul really well. The work that they've done at Southampton, if you look at the business that they've done, they signed people like Nathaniel Klein for three and a half million quid, sold him mm-hmm. for 22 plus, Dejan Lovren, Sadio Mane. I mean, they are a talent factory in terms of the players that they spot and they get them before their big, big move. And it goes on to fund a club, you know, they, they reinvest the money. The scouting work and the recruitment work that they do at Southampton is fantastic. And it genuinely is a, a role model for, for every other club outside of the top seven in terms of what you can do by finding talent at the right time. Going back to what I said before, do you want to be signing Jordan Pickford for £30 million pounds from, from Sunderland at this age? Or do you want to be signing him two years ago for mm-hmm. £6 million quid and then be in the team that sells him for 35 and then cash out but that's yeah. what want to be and Southampton have absolutely nailed that in the last five or six years um, and I take my hat off to, to Les Reed and the guys at Southampton for, for the way they've done it it's been, it's been fantastic Bournemouth are you guys still in the market for more players or is the checkbook closed I think we've got to let some out before we sign any more I don't think we can <laughs> we've got a little changing room at, at, at the Vitality you know it's, uh, it's a small little stadium I don't know if we fit them all in the transfer season is uh, going to run and run and run And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to talk about as the weeks go by. Now, that's our time. I'd like to thank Linus. I'd like to thank Pascal and Andy Burton. Join us again next week for another Pep Talk UK podcast. Oh, brilliant. Thank you.